when I read the Quran, I, I didn't go into it with the mindset that I'm going to be mind blown. I went into it with the mindset that let me see what this has to say. And when I did that and I took away all my all like the, the, the fallacy I had in my head about how blown away I'd be to reading it actually for what it is. There was no two ways, but like I, there, there, I couldn't do anything to, to figure out a way where women could be made an integral part of this enough to stay a part of it. Hi, my name's Noria. I am a second generation British Pakistani and I grew up in England in a moderate to conservative Sunni household. Um, and I'm qualifying to become like a human rights lawyer. Um, and I, for the purposes of the movement, will happily call myself an ex-Muslim. Uh, so I grew up in in England and my grandfather was like the, the gatekeeper, like, if you will, of the local mosque. Um, so I used to literally take such an interest and go with him, kind of, I, I would wear hijab, I'd go to Quran classes every evening after school. And it was very much part of my identity to the point where I even wanted to know beyond like the Arabic of the Quran. And I, I carried a translation book with me. Um, and I was very like driven to show my outward identity as a Muslim. Um, and just because my grandfather was so proud of me as well, I would take part in like um, memorizing the Quran. And I was on my way to becoming like the female version of a Hafiz, if you will. But like I started trying to memorize uh, the ayats and then being able to recite them in like the most beautiful manner. Um, but this is like within our local community while I was younger. Um, so Islam very much like held a predominant like part of my identity while I was in the UK um, to the point where like even at school in RE I was chosen to like show demonstrate to the class how to read prayer and demonstrate namaz to them um, and I did that happily and I was like very very proud of it and um, I wouldn't leave the house like every morning I'd argue with my mom because like the pin of my hijab had to be perfect like bless her she dealt with so much but I wouldn't leave the house until it was like perfect and then I was I was only seven years old at the time but I did think if this is what God has prescribed for us if this is what's like said then I should do it but when I did adorn the hijab and I you know I told my family and this is what I wanted to do at seven years old they kind of came back to me with, um, are you sure? Like, you're so young. You don't, Like, if you do this, it's really hard to come back from this. And I was shocked because I thought this is what God has prescribed. So instead of celebrating my decision, they're kind of just checking in on me. Um, whereas I feel like everybody should be doing this. If this is what God has said is the right thing to do, why are we not all adorning hijab? Um, and then obviously like down the line I became, I was a bit of a tomboy growing up so I played a lot of sports and just playing football and playing cricket and climbing, climbing frames with hijab becomes very impractical and cumbersome. Um, so eventually I did take it off um, and that all happened during, like while living in the UK where I felt like my identity was a very big deal um, because later I moved to Saudi Arabia and the hijab seemed like it was minuscule in comparison because obviously the state governs daily life and daily life is so religious be because of the state in itself so you don't need to kind of outwardly show your Muslim identity whereas I think in the UK I felt like I want to be seen as a Muslim woman and therefore like the hijab and all of these things are more important. Uh, for me Islam was just the inherent truth because it has it was what was passed down to me in in my family like there was no there was no alternative like it was just this is the god given truth and this is what we abide by and this is what you should abide by and i i was like i was a curious cat even when i was younger and i would look at things and be like well god made dinosaurs then why did god make dinosaurs and 
um, like the answers I'd get were just he was testing his creation and things like that. And I, I would take that at surface level. I would accept it. I would be like, okay, that makes sense. He was testing creation. But then I would read the science and think, why was he testing his creation for like a million years to know that these these creatures can't you know, conform to his will or whatever. And then I was like, it seems a bit weird for an all-knowing, omnipotent creator to create creatures that just don't abide by his test, which is what's put on us humans. Um, so yeah, Islam was very much like a given. I There was no, there was no evidence-based anything that I was looking at to see. Like I would take the translations at face value. I would take the Quran at face value. I would, I would take the stories I was told if I'm having dinner with my entire family and you know, like I'm playing with my food or I'm messing around and my grandfather, my grandfather would tell me like, oh, you know, like the devil will come in in between and like, you know, just if, if if you talk while you're eating, the devil will pee in your food and things like that. I would, I just took it face value. There was, there was nothing evidence based. I feel like it was just passed on. And I, because we're living in like the UK, I wanted to hold on to as much as uh, of our identity as they held on to, which was obviously cultural as well and 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 patriotic and whatever. But a lot of it was deep rooted in Islam. Um, so I didn't question anything they told me. I just kind of took it at face value and like accepted it and and internalized it and just acted on within those realms. And I believing those things that they they very much believed. Um, like even going to the bathroom, for example, um, they would say that like there's an angel waiting outside, like recording your deeds. And so like if for example, like I have lots of siblings, so you sometimes call out to your siblings, you know, like oh I I need this or whatever. And they would say like, that's so haram because the angel feels like you're finished in the bathroom, but you're not. So they're recording these bad deeds. And I was just a bit weirded out that like the religion or God's like approval like seeps so deep into something so trivial. Um, but that's just something that was passed down. I, there was nothing in terms of evidence or anything that I lent towards to, to like, you know, um, consolidate my faith. Um, so we moved from Saudi Arabia back to, uh, sorry, to Dubai. And it seemed at the time like the perfect transition because I always knew I'd come back to England for university. Um, so where Dubai, where Saudi, for example, felt very restricted because I was growing up, I wasn't able to learn how to drive. Um, there's no such thing as cinemas. You're all just getting pir like pirated films people are crossing the border to go to Bahrain to watch movies over the weekend so all of those things started feeling very repressive um the need to wear an abaya became more and more strict the need to cover your head um things like that the need to like meeting in mixed groups became very like you'd have to pick your specific spot and that just became very draining like at that age you you know you you think that you're going to have access to just being like a normal teenager as you would and because I'd always come back to England so I'd always have this as my reference point um which is where things are just a lot more normal um but then moving to the UAE um it seemed like a good transition because women for example are allowed to drive you don't need to wear the abaya it, the the cinemas and that was a big deal coming from Saudi Arabia like this is like, okay, I'm at this age, this is perfect because now I can get behind a wheel, I can take off my abaya, I can go to the movies, I can interact with boys, like none of this is forbidden. Um, and then basically I came back to England for uh, university and when I moved back in 2015, um, I got married and a lot of it was due to like societal pressure because at a certain age you can't be seen to be dating especially in Pakistani culture like it's either like you're married or you're you're you know you're not um so I was kind of rushed into this marriage very early on and um like it transpired like very soon after the honeymoon that kind of things went southwards and there was like emotional abuse financial abuse um uh, to the point where where there was a threat of physical abuse, I thought, okay, let me go back to my parents' house. 
Um, and in Dubai, for like all intents and purposes, moving from your husband to your father is like moving from one mahram, which is like a guardian in Islam, to another. So I had moved to my father's house and um, then I kind of like started to get my life back together and I found a new job. So one day on the way to work, I got a call from the Dubai police telling me that you have like a Dazaljia order on you. And I didn't know what this meant, but then I inquired like, what does this mean? What's a da? What's a Dazaljia? And it's a forceful order so they can arrest you, but you have to forcefully return to your marital home, whether you're being abused or whether you're in fear of your life or anything. Regardless, you're essentially held hostage in, in your marital home. And I lived in Dubai a number of years, but obviously, like, I still thought that, you know, you know, jurisprudence holds up to this degree where you can't send somebody back to some a place that they're fearful of. Like, you can't hold somebody against their will. Um, so essentially, like I told my parents, and they were exactly on the same standing as me, that there is no way we're sending you back to that household Um, except in Dubai, there was a way. Um, if you have a very, very like conniving, cheeky lawyer, these elements of Sharia, which seem to be disposed of, still creep up in the UAE modern legal processes, and you can make use of these instruments. Um, and that's exactly what he did. So basically, he enforced this order on me, um, like citing disobedience. And at the time, like I'm, I'm obviously still a practicing Muslim. Like I, I didn't know this had any affiliation to the to the Quran per se, um, but according to the police, I was disobedient in the sense that I had returned to my father's home without his permission. Um, and so, according to them, they were able to arrest me um, and send me back forcefully. And the only way for me to answer no to being forcefully taken back was to initiate a divorce. Um, so obviously, like when you're going through something like this, you aim for, okay, I've separated from you. Let's think of an amicable solution to fix this in the best way possible without going to court. Um, so while that was all transpiring, uh, a number of other like criminal induced cases were put on me for like theft and um, adultery. One of them, like he was stalking me for a long, long time. He was following me, he was looking at my new place of work, he was monitoring it, um, and the World Cup was going on, so we were all gathering as a group to watch the matches, and he had essentially spied on me. And basically, when the UAE police got to the point where, again, I thought I'm in an Islamic state where women's rights also count for something, I would go to them and I would tell them, like, I woke up this morning to like a potion of what looks like black magic concoctions outside of my house. They, they weren't interested. I was telling them I was like being followed. I was being, you know, stalked. I'm like, I feel like there's somebody constantly monitoring my house. I have photographic evidence um, because I was receiving like random threatening messages from delivery men, things like that. So you would assume that the, the police would do something to step in at this point because as a response to the Ta'az al put on you, you have no right as a woman to, to refuse the police besides initiating a divorce, which is exactly what I did. But they give you the condition of you can initiate this divorce, but you give up all your Islamic rights, right? So all the rights you would have to maintenance and things like that, which is entirely fine because at this point, all I cared about was my freedom. But this is a very important point in, in terms of like Islamic jurisprudence, like in, in the wider picture, uh, what it means for women, because apparently this is what the meher and all of that should safeguard. But in this situation that because they put me into such a corner where they use the ta'az al and my only response was a no, it means I had to forfeit all my rights, which was still okay because my end goal was just a divorce. But before that could even get registered in a court, of law in Dubai, you have to go through family counseling. And this family counseling session was so heavily Islamic, like influenced that, you know, to the point where I had, I had absconded almost from this house, which yes, fair enough, they can misconstrue because that, that's the art of law. And this is what Sharia allows for because 
now I realize that it's derived directly from Quranic verses, but the Quranic verses is the Quranic verse states that if you fear disobedience from your wife, and disobedience is akin to so much, it could be anything. Uh, and the Arabic word for that, I, I think, is nushas. And that's so easily misconstrued to anything um, that that's what they use. But um, because I had returned to another mehram, for example, the police tried to kind of call me back to the station and force me there. And because I was slightly aware of my rights, I was able to say, no, I don't need to come with you at a certain time. And again, this is where later down the line I saw the discrepancies in how Islamic law is applied to fulfilling women's rights and men's obligations because it's just so skewed. So um, basically, when I realized that the only way to answer this Ta'a Zawjiyah that was put on me was to initiate a divorce, I went ahead and did that. Um, but in Sharia, that means that because I'm initiating this divorce as a woman, and I want to free myself, it means I give up inherently all my rights, which again, I was fine to do because my end goal was divorce. But I know there's so many women out there who are married off uh, based on, you know, their meher and things like that. And they have no alternative because they don't have an education and they can't find jobs and things like that. But for me in that situation, I was still like my main goal is just divorce. And I can deal with the other factors um, when and as they hit. But Islamically, I got married, so Islamically, I wanted to get divorced. And at this time, I was still like a Muslim, like with all my heart, I believed in Islam. Um, the only issue I had was, at this point, was because of the relationship I was in, um, he would like, he would say two talaqs and kind of linger on the third one as a joke, because as a Muslim, that, that means a lot to me. If we're not married anymore in the eyes of God, then, you know, we're not married at all. So if you say those three words, effectively, we're not married anymore. Um, so one of the times when he did say all three, in my heart of hearts and in my mind, I had checked out of the marriage. I was like, this is no longer okay. This is not a marriage under the sanctity of God. So um, when this had transpired a long time ago, but you're still trying to go through the courts of the UAE, before they register your divorce in course, they, they send you to family counseling. And in my case, the family counseling was very like religious heavy. So to the point where he, you know, the official would ask us like how many times a day we pray and if we've lost our closeness to God. And obviously in, in my case, um, the divorce was very one-sided. Like, so in that environment, you're able to manipulate a lot of things. And so you know, my ex said things that like I was possessed and I wanted a divorce because, you know, there's a gin on me. And these officials actually buy into these arguments and they, they give you more time and more leeway to try and fix the issue. So for a woman, you're just dealing with, first of all, the whole taboo of going through a divorce, especially in South Asia and Pakistani families, you know, divorce is like the last thing. You you do everything to try and avoid a divorce. But if if you're there already then anything beyond that is just even more disgraceful. But if somebody's kind of telling you, you know, trying to convince an official that you're you're mentally not okay or there's somebody possessing you, you have to play the part just to get access from that legal system to give you your freedom. Um, and, I, and I was relying on that for a very long time until the point where the criminal cases were just building up on me um, to the point where I had to call the embassy and the British embassy just advised me to leave. Um, and that's what I did. <laughs> so even after everything that had transpired in the UAE, I came back to the UK and I was, I was still very much Muslim, like for all intents and purposes. But the only thing that had changed was because I wanted to move on with my life and I, I knew that I would be against people, especially being back in England, um, who would tell me that what you went through was just something that Islam does to you. And I, as a like as a believing Muslim, wanted to be able to be armed enough to say, no, that's actually not what my religion prescribes. That was a perversion of their culture, of their legal system, of all of that. So 
I came back here when things had settled down and I acknowledged what had happened to me and I googled like because I, I also for my own purposes like I wanted to know where that Zogia stems from how can you apply this um, so I started looking into it and I came across like various transcripts but most of them led back to like the the most modern like state to implement anything related to Ta'az al is Egypt and they had a whole discussion about what disobedience means which is nushas and and what that means but that is directly related to the Quranic verse Surah Nisa the famous verse which basically says if you fear disobedience from your wife so this was a whole talk on this and what I had realized is that a lot of modern GCC and Arab states don't employ this tactic. But if you really wanted to, it's not a tactic that is so benign that it doesn't exist anymore. You can still pick it up and use it as a legal loophole because in my case, disobedience meant I left the house without his permission and that suffices. So when I looked into it, I was like, okay, because I had studied uh, a module of Islamic law at university and I was still a practicing Muslim at that, at that point so I was kind of like if I can go through a whole module of Islamic law now thinking back at it without doubting my religion having seen what I've seen and having seen the essays that I've written myself um, as a woman it's 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 weird because when I was at this point I was reading the Quran and I was still like okay but give me something like give me something to hold on to that I would still be like there's a reason why you've made men slightly superior and women slightly inferior like there's a reason and then I saw I read the Quran and I read those surahs that were directly linked back to the ayat that I think this law derives from which was put on me and I don't know if I went into it with a more objective like point of view but when you read that like I, I remember reading it once I was like okay reading it twice and then the third time I was like you have to accept it this is what it says clear as day for women this is what it says and that from that point on like you can't not see it from an objective point of view because I came from a position of wanting to defend my faith and then I was like open-minded enough to read the text because I am like I am I have studied law I am I like I do plan on becoming a full-on lawyer um, so I'm very interested in like the you know the legalities of all of it and it's very clever the way that you can derive this from the Quran and keep words like disobedience so open-ended um, it's not different from like the anti-terrorism laws that the UK has it's like a catch-all like the way that they've defined certain words it really does um, enable loopholes and things like that and what Islam gives that upper hand to men and, and I just started reading the text with that like it blaring out to me that I couldn't ignore it anymore so when I obviously looked into the sources that enabled everything that happened to me I went straight to the Quran because that's where Sharia derives from and I looked into everything the Quran had to say about women and oh, for the first time what I was reading I was reading with an objective mind as opposed to being awed by what I am reading so for example Surah Nisa the famous Surah um, I read the verses like clear as day and I remember reading them the first time and taking it in but not being convinced so I read them a second time and then I read them a third time and I remember thinking oh my gosh like this is bad this as clear as day states that in, in, in multiple different areas in different ways women are inferior to men men have a right over women uh, women are predominantly like combining the Quran and the Hadith together and I know there's a lot of contention around the Hadith but a lot of Sunni Muslims do like get a lot of what they believe it from the Hadith so I did look in purely just the Quran but that was enough uh, there was enough sexism in the Quran enough misogyny at the fact that women can be beaten the fact that women's inheritance is half um, the fact that women's testimony is akin to half of a man's in court 
all of these things just like struck out at me. I was reading it for the first time from an objective point of view and thinking, okay, my my entire life I've sought to defending this ideology as, you know, Islam freed slaves, Islam stopped baby women, baby girl infants from being buried alive. Islam did all of that. Islam pioneered that. To me, reading the primary script, scripture of Islam and seeing that men have a right over women and like that that's there clear as day so I did genuinely like honestly from the the point of a lawyer I felt like what happened to me in the UAE was very much justified through these verses like I as a lawyer could use these verses to justify what happened to me um but then that is depriving somebody of their basic human rights and that's what the Quran enables and that's where the penny dropped for me. When I scrutinized the Quran with the same like legal mind that I had scrutinized an act of law, I was like, if somebody was arguing against me for this point, I would have not a leg to stand on because they are right. The Quran gives men power. The Quran gives men the right of divorce. The Quran gives men more inheritance. The Quran does all of it. It literally unleashes this framework. And Obviously, then when you read that, and then I, I specifically went back to the Hadith to see if Prophet Muhammad's actions lined up to this, because the doubts really ensued then that these were kind of, the, the Quran and the Hadith go hand in hand, the Sunnah, everything, because this is probably all constricted by Muhammad himself. So I went back to the Hadith, and I saw the exact same treatment of women, if not worse. Um women are deficient in intellect and religion, women are going to be the majority in hell, if a black dog, a donkey or a woman crosses you during prayer it's invalid. So what are women grouped in with? Women are grouped in with dogs, with donkeys, women are likened to chattel and being traded as camels and things like that. The beating of women is likened to the miswak branches that were used to tame camel and sheep back in the day to women. That's how you discipline your women. So all of these different pieces of the puzzle started coming together for me. And I realized that, of course, of course, the Quran would say this because this is the way Muhammad perceived women in his life. And this is the way he dealt with women in his life. And obviously, Sharia is derived from the Quran. So there was no two ways about it. Believe me, like I did everything in my power. I wanted to still believe in Islam. I held on to the fact that the imams and the sheikhs were completely misconstruing this. The, U the UAE legal system had failed me. And, you know, they, they just messed with what was divine eternal law but when I looked into the like derivation of that eternal law it is the Quran itself and the Quran is saying it clear as day I mean it's not just surah and Nisa there's other surahs where you know Allah's uh warning the prophet that if he divorced you he can get better wives things like that then there's there's um ayats which talk about uh marrying women who have menstruated and who have not menstruated and that, that for me, again, I'm looking at it with a legal brain, but I was like, that, that allows any child. And like, uh, what problems do we have in Afghanistan and Pakistan and all of these countries is the fact that these sheikhs are getting married to, to girls who are way, way, way younger than them. But these are all justified. And, I, and before that, I, I really maintained a healthy, I believed I was a progressive Muslim. I, I kind of veered more towards Sufism. And I was like, love is God and God is love. And I had never gotten to the nitty gritty of the Quran as I did when I had to research what was done to me. And when I did that, I tried to research with as open mind as possible. And the conclusions I came to were just you cannot get away from it. You cannot get away from the fact that women are subordinate in the Quran. Women are inferior. And you are basically a walking womb. If we talk about the most literalist interpretation of Islam being followed based on the Quran, then women are basically just a walking womb for them. 
And then, you, you know, you have the whole rape culture, modesty culture enforced by, by the hijab, which is a whole nother separate issue. But again, it ties into that bigger picture of this is a religion made by men for men. And for some reason, after everything that had transpired in the UAE, when I read the Quran, I, I didn't go into it with the mindset that I'm going to be mind blown. I went into it with the mindset that let me see what this has to say. And when I did that, and I took away all my, all like the, the, the fallacy I had in my head about how blown away I'd be to reading it actually for what it is, there was no two ways, but I, I, there, there, I couldn't do anything to, to figure out a way where women could be made an integral part of this enough to stay a part of it. Like, you're way better off outside of this than being what Islam tells you to be. And uh, yeah, that, that, that ties into culture in a lot of ways, but that's a different story. Uh, so I remember reading the Quran for like the, just the, the third time, these kind of ayats that really stuck with me. And, and then I was like, okay, let me see if anybody else also agree. To, to be honest, when you read it and you come to that conclusion, you genuinely think you're the only person who's, who's realized this. Um, and because obviously like I have no roots in England, like I have roots in England, but I, I hadn't nurtured those roots because I was in the, the Middle East for so long. Um, I came back here and realized all of this and didn't know like where the outlet was. So I went on like on online and I just searched for things to do with Islam that I was inherently interested in. And I came across channels like obviously Master Arab, Sharif Gabra, things like that. And I was okay, these are like native Arab speakers because, well, first of all, I already, since I was a child, I had a doubt that I felt like non-Arab Muslims had like a like an unfair hurdle on them to understand the Quran and to understand Islam because it's so Arab centric, like the whole thing is revealed in Arabic. I'm sorry, if I'm living in Pakistan, like what do I have to do with like Arabic? You know, but I, if I want to maintain the right path, like show it to me in my language. Um, so that was never a thing. So I had a lot of friends that spoke Arabic when I, and I was very interested in learning it myself. But when I was like, okay, we're in the when we're in the 21st century, I can get every single translation I ever wanted in English, um, and this has been done time and time again. So let me let me scour this, and then once I had realized what it meant for women in English, I just went back to the native Arabic speakers just to check, like you know, I wasn't checking out of this ideology for nothing. I, like my 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 concerns are warranted. And then I, I kind of watched these YouTube channels and they were saying the actual root terms of these Arabic words that I was suspicious of, like daraba, and now even like nikah, things like that, that, that I thought that was marriage. Now I understand that it means sexual intercourse and, you know, that's why the whole nikah is so contractual and it's, it's, very, it's very much like you're paying a price to have sexual intercourse with a woman and that's what the whole basis of Islamic marriage is but I didn't think that at the time and I still know like so much of my like so many of my family my friends they're so adamant on doing an igam what like they they, ha they they hold that in such high regard um as I did but like when you research it I try to look into like Arabic native speakers see what they had to say and it's essentially the same thing and they're kind of trying to warn you of the bullshit that you will get fed by people who are trying to you know tone it down or reform it and that kind of thing uh like virgins is like honey and whatever whatever the methods they're trying but when I kind of read about the just the the worth of women in the Quran, the worth of women according to Muhammad in the Hadith and things like that. There was no two ways about it. Like I'm not even like a raging feminist. I'm just a normal woman of my age in this day and age trying to say that, you know, we should have equal rights, like nothing deeper than that. But when I objectively looked at Islam, I realized it was depriving me of that. In fact, it was like wrapping you in a circle of 
complete misogyny and patriarchy and devaluing your worth to your just your body or literally a walking womb for Islam. Like, it's not about your value for just existing and your, you know, your educational ability, your skills, your talents, anything else you bring to the table, it's purely sexual. Um, why, why they're putting hijab on young girls, why you have to wear hijab in front of your uncles. This is all perpetuating like rape culture, modesty culture. Until I had realized that for my entire like childhood, I believed that that was the right thing. Women should cover up and that's our uh, role in life. Moving to Saudi, that changed because I grew up in an international school and outside of the climate, I realized that's necessary. But then talking to so many international people, I was obviously getting more and more liberal. Then moving back to the UAE, like I had a very liberal mindset, but I still held Islam very near and dear. Coming back to the UK and reading these without apologetics, without having any bias in my mind, it was clear as day. You cannot stand for like women's empowerment or feminism and still be a Muslim. You cannot argue for the same thing because that truly means you haven't read the scripture. If you read the scripture, it's completely going against feminism. You are half the worth of what a man is. So, for, uh, and, and that's literally what struck, struck me. I, I couldn't go on. Uh, so basically when I realized that this is something I can no longer subscribe to, and I actually want nothing to do with because of how dark this ideology can be. Um, and also just because by default, like when I go out, I'm, I'm assumed to be a Muslim and I don't want that tag. Um, I didn't intend to obviously come out to my family or anybody because I just feel like it's too, it's too much. Like nobody could have, nobody can handle this. We've not dealt with apostasy in, in, in my family at all. Even though they're very educated, they're very progressive, they're very liberal, um, the, the older generation are a lot more conservative and a lot more like hardcore into the religion. Um, so I never intended to come out like just by saying how I feel, but it just so happened that um, some of my tweets were seen and um, my dad asked me if I was now an ex-Muslim and I said that I didn't necessarily subscribe to that title, but for all intents and purposes for this movement, yes, like I am one. Um, but I was living with my grandparents at the time and I remember trying to talk to my grandma just about something to do with Muhammad, and she completely flipped at me and she was like, you're never going to be happy if you don't love the Prophet. Because I was just questioning his one of his marriages, his marriage to Aisha. Um... And she's very much a lady who doesn't believe in the Hadith, but just believes in the Quran. And so I had a lot of issues with that. Um, and we would have deep, deep chats about like, if God exists, who created God and think But she would always recline back to the Islamic view that there's certain things that are beyond the human scope. And so we don't know about them and we'll never know. Don't distress yourself learning about those things. And we'd end the conversation there. But... Um, Obviously, when you realize something, when you realize something as big as everything you know and think to be true and you love and you want to stand by could potentially be a con, you want to pass that on. And that's how I felt. Like I wanted to save if I've if I know this truth and I'm I don't even have an IQ, like a high IQ. I don't consider myself to be like, you know, extra smart. I'm just somebody who things critically and I'm saying this could be very wrong I want my parents and my siblings to also think yeah okay maybe this could be very wrong but uh that, that's not the case like as as a as an ex-Muslim you have to be so careful the way you kind of tread around your family and I remember trying to bring it up to my family on a number of occasions and and like quoting certain hadiths and showing them clear verses of the Quran but if some if this is what I've realized is that if people, there's a lot of people in the world who if you give them certain evidence that will contradict their beliefs, they're still not ready to believe that, they're still not ready to accept that. There's a very small percentage of people who are genuinely searching for the truth where if they were provided with the evidence contrary to their beliefs, they would 
go on the side of the evidence, which is how I hope that I am now, because I don't intend to believe anything ever that's, you know, that has no evidence to it. But because Islam and culture are so intertwined, um, which I think is also inherently problematic from the Quran, um, it, 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 people are scared. People are scared to, to folk, like the people I've met in terms of their reactions to what I'm saying has been almost threefold. There's the type of reactionaries where they think, okay, I, I also don't agree with that, but I'm going to ignore, like, I'm going to ignore my disagreement for that and just stay in the comfort of Islam. There's some people who outright say that's fabricated. These are lies and I don't accept them. If you turn, and that's for Hadith, that works fine. If you turn them to the Quran, they genuinely tap out of the conversation because they just can't deal. And then you have the third kind who genuinely mistake every excess thing that Islam has done. They put it down to culture. And they say that's not Islam, that's culture. So you're like fighting on three fronts almost. You're fighting on people who are saying, you know, that's fabricated. You're fighting on people who are saying, I disagree, but I'm still a Muslim. And you're fighting people who say, that is, um, like, I disagree with that, but like, what, what am I supposed to do? And they're happy. So you, like, all of it comes down to, literally, ironically, the first word of Islam, ikra, like read, read your scriptures. Because that, this is exactly how I was. And I feel like I just saw a Twitter post earlier today on my way here that progressive Muslims are just stuck in the middle. They're just in denial. And there's such a high level of cognitive dissonance and mental gymnastics operating in that sphere that there's only a matter, matter of time before you, you know, you, you jump to the side where you're like, if I don't believe in the divine wisdom of God and I disagree with this, then how, how is this still Islam? So it's kind of just uh, that leap that people need to take, which I feel like they're afraid of because they're so comfortable wrapped in the bubble of Islam and what it offers them. Um, honestly, in the 21st century, I do not think Islam and human rights are compatible. I think it's a massive clash of civilizations um, just because the basic like primary source text of Islam uh, do not even equate the two genders. Um, there's a massive discrepancy. Men have a right over women. Um, and so there's no way you can use this as a basis of like human rights in this day and age. Um, I feel like anybody who even considers themselves a, like so-called feminist, even at the like lowest scale where you just feel like you you belong on an equal footing to men and you deserve equal rights, Islam itself tells you in its primary texts that you are worth half of a man. Your word is worth half of a man. You have to cover up because your entire identity is based on like what you can sexually give a man. That's it. That's it. Your entire marriage. Like before this, I genuinely used to believe in like a nigah and it's like, you know, marriage under God's eyes. But reading into it, like when you read into all of these things, nikah means like sexual intercourse. It's from the root word of like the NKH in, in Arabic, which is nikah, which is literally sexual intercourse. So the man is paying you contractually to benefit from your sexual services. That's essentially what it is. And I know a lot of women wouldn't like to hear that and they wouldn't like to see that in their research but that's what it is so you can argue till the cows come home that like the hijab is empowering and this and that but again if you have the audacity to look into the roots of why hijab was um, ordained for women you would see that it all results from a place of misogyny and patriarchy and and reducing a woman to her sexual worth that's absolutely it like it's nothing else that you bring to the table matters like not just your value for existing as a human being not your skills not your intellect not your education not your talents nothing matters and the fact that you have to 
after a certain age like adorn this as a muslim woman like i know there's a lot of women out there who are you know non-hijabi and then they meet islamic women who are and they suddenly feel like a sense of inferiority because they're not the perceived muslim woman for some reason i never felt that i always felt that religion was a personal thing so i was never afflicted with that issue but the thing the fact that i wore it myself to show that i was a muslim moving to muslim country showed me that that wasn't as important like it is more what's in your heart and then moving to the uk and researching islam for what it is showed me that actually islam is a very dangerous ideology especially for women uh you're a second class citizen you're a second class human being you have men have rights which aren't even like awarded to you divorce um and 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 these 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 certain jurisdictions who operate with sharia law will use this to manipulate you and take advantage of you and that's what happens to so many women around the world like this is why in iran you have the uh white wednesday protest and you have the my camera is my weapon protest because it's so easy for you to hear like be exactly how i was when i was 7 to 9 years old in england wearing a hijab thinking i was completely fulfilling god's duty thinking i was doing the right thing you have so many women who think that and that's a choice for them here um but okay that's fine that's a choice for you here that works but let's put you in an islamic state let's put you in iran let's put you in saudi arabia that's not a choice so i just don't know how they feel like this equates to feminism it really is like how like haris sultan describes it in his channel it's like a chicken saying they like kfc it just doesn't work the whole, if you like my whole idea is if you do something you need to know the history behind it you need to know why it came about hijab if you want to wear it you need to look into it you need to look into its origins and as a woman if you can truly look me in the eye and say that this hijab has come about without being repressive to women without reducing women to their sexuality without hypersexualizing children without doing all of these things without just being a protection from the male gaze without perpetuating rape culture then by all means i'm for hijab but i don't think you can say that wholeheartedly that's just not the case in saudi arabia in iran in all these places you get persecuted if you're not wearing hijab you're just lucky to have grown up in the west and you can choose to wear it as a part of your identity which is exactly what i decided to do and ironically when i moved to a country where that wasn't a, like a necessity i gave it up completely like it wasn't it, it didn't need to be done and the main point for me was i was kind of thinking about why did i wear hijab and thinking about it it wearing the hijab i just cause my mom a hassle every morning but personally i did not feel any closer to god than i did without it at all there there was no difference it was just an identity marker for me but now as like more of a grown woman i look into the origins of the hijab i see how it's so involved in patriarchy and it's there to separate the believing women from the women who are fair game to the muslims and 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 the fact that you can even enable yourself to be part of this and whatever story they spew you about being like a lollipop uncovered and it attracts flies and but but you need to understand how deep rooted the misogyny goes for you to even feel like that's a valid justification it goes way beyond that and when you start realizing that you'll realize how making yourself slightly more invisible is beneficial to them and nobody else it's just impractical it's stopping you from being exactly who you want to be and you're just catering to the male desire and that's perpetuating a vicious cycle that's all it is um as far as god as in like a big daddy in the sky allah i don't believe there's any such thing i think it's p- I think the concoction of Allah was purely man-made. Um it's like an alter ego of Muhammad if you will. Um but having said that like I'm very interested in eastern philosophy. I'm very interested in like uh just the the path to the noble truths that Buddhism offers. I'm I'm intrigued by like the cosmological explanations that Hinduism gives. 
but never subscribing to an actual God. I feel like once you come out of Islam, it feels like you've lost your life to such a big con that you're so scared of allowing anything without evidence to infiltrate your being or your persona or your anything like that. So I feel like you're just wary. So I'm very, very wary of accepting anything now without evidence. But like on the other side of the token, I was very, when I was a Muslim, I was very much um, indulged in like conspiracy theories, like I'd read about them. And I just feel like because your brain is malleable to the point where you're believing that the prophet rode up on like a winged horse to heaven, you're also more likely to believe like, you know, there's an Illuminati behind things and there's certain conspiracies. You're, you're very much more inclined because logic is not your base point, like reason is not your base point and neither is evidence. So now that I've come out of Islam, even my entire like passion for just reading into conspiracies or whatever, um, falsifying them has just gone out the window because I don't take anything to be literal fact now, unless it is. Um, I'm interested in philosophies. I'm interested in what people have to say across different cultures. I'm, I'm interested in exploring different ideas, but until there's like hard proof fact, I don't think it's possible to accept anymore. I think Islam put such a, di a level of distrust in you because you've been lied to on such a grand scale since you were essentially a newborn. Like when we were babies, the azan was whispered into our ear. Like that's your entire being. Um, to grow up and even be feel different from your parents. Like I do feel like there's a certain tension in the house just because I my views are very differently aligned. You you feel that, but also you know that they're educated, so they'll let you be. But it's just it, it it's it's weird because you cannot now accept anything as truth until it's there in front of you. It it damages you in such a way where if you can be con to that extent, it's like that expression, right? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me that's exactly what it is like I don't want to be shamed twice there's no way I'll I'll accept something now without full-on hardcore evidence scientific reasoning backing it um so obviously from a from an Islamic perspective um it just then helping me like fully concrete my ideas about what the Quran says was obviously YouTube channels and people like Master Arab and Sharif Gaber um but just as a feminist in general and realizing that religion and government and judiciary need to be separate there are people like Noala Sadawi from Egypt and uh, like Ayan Hirsi Ali, uh, Mariam Namazi just by for opting for like a like one law for all where you know because again I talk about um, how I was marginalized from a religious context but also the opposite happens in the UK where women are religiously married so they can't get the secular protection that they deserve so that's like another to it's the same token of what I went through just the opposite side of it uh so women who are fighting for like one law for all but particularly women who are coming out as ex-Muslim um and I feel like Mariam Namazi did pioneer this movement about a decade ago um because even when I realized this just like four years ago, I didn't realize there was a movement behind it or there were even, you know, like pioneers or like, and I always, like I've always been kind of, uh, I've always tried to be well read and I, and I know that any movement has to stand on the shoulder of giants. And I feel like in this movement and being able to speak about leaving Islam, there are only people like Mariam Namazi and Ayan Hirsi Ali and Nawal Al Sadawi who have actually pioneered the concept of secularism for women to follow. And also not just secularism, but but highlighting, like putting the spotlight on Islam and saying this is problematic and this is I feel like there's a lot of people who come and go, but they just fall off the radar. But these are women who have dedicated their lives to this, like risked everything to say what they want to say and 
if I can play like a small part in that in any way, then like that's all I aspire to do because, and again, like I don't like labels, but ex-Muslim, if it helps pioneer this movement, then I'm all for it because there is no way. And, and, and I just hope that women read this and they, they look into their sources and use the first words of Islam as like inspiration, like read, read your actual sources because that's enough for you to leave Islam. The treatment of women in itself, like we can go into the scientific aspects, we can go into historiography, we can go into um, contradictions in the Quran, we can go into so many different things, but just the, the, the value that it gives to women, as a woman, you should be taken aback by that because it just doesn't fit into any of our narratives in the 21st century when you're starting off on a footing that's not equal to men you're starting off below men and maybe in islam the only actual privilege you get is being a mother because they say heaven is at the mother's feet but that that's it and i feel like the the more that women look into the reasons of why they're actually wearing hijab why they're doing what they're doing it would change a lot. Now you have these translations at your fingertips. They're not, they're not kafir channels. They're not the channels of infidels. These are Islamic actual websites. They're giving you the translations of the Quran. You just read it and you critically think for yourself and you see where that places you and you see the ideas that you're perpetuating and you realize that's just not okay. What you're, you're not just perpetuating the Islamic culture of this, but you're perpetuating modern day rape culture and modesty culture and all of these things that we're trying to move away from, Islam is holding you back in every sense of the word. Uh, yes, yeah, so basically my plan is to uh, become a human rights lawyer and go into like the practice area of public law and action against authorities and things like that. So what that is, is essentially fighting for people from whichever third world countries are trying to like gain asylum in the UK, for example, on the merits of uh, f like free thought and free belief and not being tied down to any religion um, so I know obviously the ex-Muslim movement is a thing and I'm and I'm more than willing to be a part of it but just to make this something that I'm doing day in day out um, the, especially in my home country of Pakistan for example like blasphemy laws are used politically all the time the government uses these laws to kind of suppress people online, for example, um, under the guise of blasphemy, like they suppress political opponents under the guise of blasphemy law so the public can get behind it. So you see Islam being used as a political tool, which it has been from the beginning, but you, you, it's very hard to separate Islam and politics just because I genuinely believe Islam is a political ideology in itself. It's very expansionist. It's very... Um, against infidels, it's against apostates, it's against all of these people, it's it's very intolerant, it, it has an expansionist agenda. So when you see like people trying to kind of break out of it, you it's very hard for them to do so in a country which doesn't support them like legally and socially. Uh, which is why I think it's so important that people in the West are speaking out for these women who, for example, in Iran, they don't have the right to wear, like to choose to wear hijab or not. But in England here, we, 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 we kind of celebrate that fact like it's a given and it is a given. But the thing is, it's not a given for a lot of people. And that's why we're here. So there's basic human rights that are fundamentally being ignored by pursuing an Islamic ideology and that's not okay so I, I'm like I'm not against freedom of speech or anything like that I just feel like if your opinion violates somebody's basic human right to exist then your opinion is wrong uh, because it shouldn't but and Islam falls into that categories in a lot of ways in terms of like homophobia in terms of women's rights in terms of child marriage in terms of a lot of things and the more that we have women who are actively looking and reading their scripture, I know it's very comforting to take Islam in, in its bubble and you're in the West, so you know you can portray your identity in whichever way you want. But if you're genuinely being intellectually honest 
and I don't I, I wouldn't myself subscribe to anything unless I knew the origins of it so if I'm wearing a hijab I want to know exactly why the hell I'm wearing a hijab and if you ask me why I'm wearing hijab I can answer you in a way that you know you'll have nothing to answer back to because that's how sure I am and I don't feel like a lot of Muslim women in this country can do that they are just wearing it because they think they should wear it once you look into the origins of it critically as a woman and you understand how repressive and hypersexualizing it is you would not condone it um but that that's just how it is so i like obviously um there's levels you can go to with certain people and i i'll only push them to the extent that they're willing to to go but when it comes to the quran and things like that they're not willing to look into the actual depths of what the scripture says or where the origins of the hijab for example um come from and that just leaves a massive gap because a lot of people can see problems with islam but they never go beyond that to actually do the work to look look into it and until people don't read and understand understand their scripture we're never going to come to like any progressive movement when it comes to islam because a lot of women are enabling the very toxic ideas that islam promotes by wearing hijab by wearing niqab by sitting in your iddat period for three months after divorce by allowing a second third fourth marriage you're just enabling misogyny but you really have to look inwards to see how deep rooted this is and that's a very hard thing to do if this is something you've grown up with and you know you've been brainwashed into uh so it takes a very kind of strong i feel like intellectual mind to scrutinize what it is you're seeing from a way that your parents or grandparents haven't seen it that way because i was shocked i would always ask my grandparents um when they were reading extra quran during ramadan i would ask them did you read it in urdu because that's your mother tongue so if you read like because when i read the quran genuinely for the first time in english focusing on matters that were important to me like women's issues i was shocked and that was just me reading it from arabic to english and arabic to urdu has been there for a very long time as well like all of their qurans are in urdu i know this for a fact so i asked them did you not read it in urdu and they say yeah we have and i'm just mind blown that you haven't come to the conclusion that that's offensive to me that that's very inherently wrong but but you don't and so that's why i'm very wary to say that people who are confronted with evidence that go against their beliefs are willing to change because a lot of people aren't willing to change um so it's just a matter of like consistently probing them and and checking in with their beliefs Um so I have a Twitter account at Nuria K and I have an Instagram as well but I intend to get a lot more active on Twitter and I'll be making a YouTube channel soon so I'll obviously like share the link and you can all follow me there and share your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs>